Welcome back. I'm Jeff Yi, and this is the second video in the Particles of the Universe series, and this one is on energy. I'm going to start off each of these videos with a question. Right now, you're looking at magnetic balls, and I'm going to use a lot, this in a lot of the examples. This is potential energy. If I drop it, it has kinetic energy. Now, the cool thing in physics is that energy is always conserved. So that potential energy equals the kinetic energy. The reason why I'm using these little balls is now imagine that this is an atomic nucleus, right? Protons and neutrons. And if you split it, some of that mass can be converted to a new form of energy, heat. And that's nuclear energy. So whether it's potential energy, kinetic, nuclear energy, thermal energy, chemical energy, all of it is conserved but we don't know how. And that becomes the first question. How are all these forms of energy connected and related? Before beginning the video, two quick notes. The first is that all of the information you'll see in the video is provided in book series and also online. And you'll find the URLs for Amazon and the website below in the YouTube description. The second thing is that the slides have been color coded Blue slides, which I will be going over, provide an overview and an explanation on a topic. The red slides are typically more proof, a lot of which is mathematical, which I will skip for the video, but I will be pausing on the slides and I'll leave it up for about five seconds, allowing you to hit pause at any time if you want to go through the details. And this first red slide is a perfect example. I will not go through the details, but here you can hit pause and return back at any time to see the wave constants and variables that are used throughout this video. And now for energy, an introduction to energy, its definition, and how it flows. But I love analogies. And I started with this one in the Particles of the Universe 2, which is a pool of water. So first imagine a pool of water which is flat and motionless. There would be no energy in this pool. And now imagine an earthquake shakes that pool such that waves are thrashing about in all different directions. Now the pool has energy and it's in the form of waves. And in physics, energy is the capability or the capacity to do work. All right, so imagine an object now floating on the surface of that pool. And here in this animated illustration, you see the ability of waves and, able to, and they're able to move this object. And the energy of those waves can be calculated based on the wave's amplitude, the speed at which it's traveling, the distance between waves, known as the wavelength, and it must be traveling in a medium with a known density. And these four properties are very important for calculating energy we're going to come back to that when we start talking about the energy within the universe. Now here's the conservation of energy, which is really cool, which states that energy will always remain the same. It can't be created or destroyed. And in the pool, we have to imagine now that there's nothing other than just the pool. There's nothing in its exteriors to be able to absorb that wave energy. So the waves continue to go back and forth and it will always remain the same. The total energy will always remain the same. But that doesn't mean that the waves will always be the same. Waves may combine or transfer forms. For example, two waves might combine and, and now have double the amplitude. And, and the latter is extremely important as we get into the details of how the universe works. Okay, so now let's apply that analogy to the universe. First we need to add one more thing before we start talking about waves, which is how can the waves move in the first place. Now consider a universe with two fundamental components that allow the transfer of energy. And one is called granules that transfers energy forwards, and one is called the wave center, which reflects it backwards. Now by the way, both of these names are, are given to two pioneers of the theory Dr. Milo Wolf and Gabriel Lafreniere. 
And in this example, first for granules, it simply just moves wave energy forward, just like in the pool, this could be a, a water molecule. But a wave center does something different. It reflects it backwards. And energy travels in sinusoidal waves with a wavelength at the speed of light. And it travels as longitudinal waves, and we'll come back to that in a moment, under a principle where each wavelet creates a, a wave front in three-dimensional space, and so they become spherical wavelets, as you see here on the right. Now this is a red slide. I mentioned that I would just pause for five seconds, and that's what I'll do moving forward for each of these slides. Now back to wavelength and speed, from that you can determine frequency. And time is really just the inverse of frequency. And so now we have a mechanism for time. Waves travel throughout the universe as longitudinal waves, and it passes through everything, literally everything, from large bodies like this Earth that rotates around the sun to people, you and me, with DNA that tells our bodies when to get old to atomic nucleus, you know, like a proton and a neutron that decay and certain elements become the mechanism for our, our atomic clocks. Time is literally flowing through everything because it's the same longitudinal wave. And time is really nothing more than a measurement of repetitive cycles and it passes through every particle. But yet we know that time is relative, when in motion at least. And so what this states is that there is a universal clock. And it's based on the standard longitudinal wave that passes through everything. But when something is in motion, its wavelength changes. And it's a property known as the Doppler effect. And so that is the basis of relativity. And we'll discuss that later. Before we get into the conservation of energy and how it transforms from one form to the next, it's important to understand the different types of waves. And so this is a longitudinal wave. And this happens with sound waves, for example. Or a good analogy is a slinky toy. The kid's slinky toy and its waves are moving the same direction as motion. A transverse wave is a little bit different. The amplitude is now perpendicular to the direction that the wave moves. And you're probably more familiar with a transverse wave. An ocean wave, for example, would be a transverse wave. Now with a longitudinal wave, its amplitude uh, is not um, perpendicular to the direction that the wave is moving. It is in the same direction. So it's a little bit harder to picture amplitude, but here's an example of amplitude, one times amplitude, and now double the amplitude. And the amplitude is moving in the same direction. And its definition is really the maximum displacement from equilibrium. And so there has an amplitude that has been calculated for the waves that travel the universe, and you can see here. Again, red slide. You can pause this if you want. And back to a transverse wave now. Here you see the amplitude of the transverse wave is uh, perpendicular now to the direction that it's moving. You can see wavelength and amplitude. The photon, which we discussed in another video, is a transverse wave. And this wavelength can change, and also amplitude can change as well. Waves have to flow through a medium, and a medium will have a density. And what's interesting to note is that the universe, for everything that work in this theory, needs a density property. And the two geometries that you see here, a sphere and a cylinder with volumes, are important for the calculations of particles as spheres and the photon as cylinders. 
So we'll come back to this again in upcoming videos as we cover particles and photons. Pause on this one, but just note that a density has been calculated for the medium of the universe. Now this is a red slide, but in this case I'm going to leave this one up long enough for you to see and understand the results since this is animated and harder to pause. This is the computer simulation from Gabriel Lafreniere of the 1887 ether experiment which fa failed to detect an ether wind. And that's in very, very important for this theory because this theory requires a density property. It's in every equation and calculation. Without density, without an ether, this theory does not exist. And so therefore, the ether has to be explained. And it can be explained, and there's lots of papers out there, with Laurent's and length contraction was failed to, uh, to be considered in one of the arms of the experiment apparatus. And that's what this is. On the left you see the actual result when length contraction was not considered, and on the right what was the expected result if there is indeed an ether wind if length contraction had been considered. So let's define energy now. And first mathematically, and then we'll get broader as we go along. But mathematically, energy is the frequency. And remember, frequency is, is wave speed and uh, wavelength. And it's the frequency and amplitude of the wave squared in a defined volume with known density. And mass is energy without consideration of wave speed for a standing wave. And forces are really just a movement of a wave center to minimize its wave amplitude. And there are two different types of waves, longitudinal and transverse. So the diagram here shows uh, black particles, wave centers, which are at node, meaning that it is at the point of minimal amplitude. It's at its equilibrium or resting place. Off node, or red that you see there for the two different types of waves, uh, will have a force and that wave center will move to the point of minimal wave amplitude. And in the upcoming videos, we're going to find that that's the cause of all motion, all forces, and it's also the cause of particle creation. Again, wave centers move to the point of minimal wave amplitude. That's a fundamental rule. Now, standing waves. What are particles? A particle is nothing more than stored energy that has mass. And it's a combination of an in wave and an out wave. And it has to reflect on something to become a standing wave, and that is a wave center. And a combination of an in wave and an out wave with the right frequency and amplitudes will create a standing wave. This happens throughout nature today. But the majority of space consists of traveling waves. I was referred to earlier as the wavelets that combine to form a spherical wavefront. But when they interact with a wave center, and when it reflects, it can create a standing wave. And that becomes stored energy. It's a standing wave by definition. It's not moving. And in the bottom right, you see that illustration of a blue wave going to the left, reflecting off of the wave center to become the green wave to the right. The red is the result of those two waves. They, those two waves, the in wave and out wave, are creating a standing wave. It goes up and down, but it's stationary, always in the same place. And so that becomes stored energy or mass of a particle. But it cannot keep that standing form for infinity, so there is a distinct point where it transitions back to traveling waves, and that becomes a particle's radius. And so let's review four key wave terms that we've covered in this section. A longitudinal wave vibrates in the direction of propagation. And the transverse wave, just like an ocean wave, vibrates at right angles to the direction of propagation. In the last slide, we covered a standing wave. Right? It goes up and down, really without moving, but it has energy, it has wave energy, and it's stored, and that becomes mass. 
The last one is a traveling wave, and it is a wave which moves. And these four waveforms, or key terms, will be shown to cause different types of energy. And energy can transform from one waveform to the next, but it will always be conserved. And so that becomes our definition now of energy. Energy is the motion of the medium, just like the waves flowing in the pool, and it has the capacity to do work. Now, because it flows as waves, it may change waveforms, but again, energy will always be conserved. And mathematically, it's described in the equation below. Wave energy has a wave with a speed, a wavelength, amplitude, and it's measured in a defined volume with a medium of a known density. And that's it. That is the definition we'll use for energy. That concludes this video. Thank you very much for joining. And now that we know what standing waves are, we'll discuss how they create particles up next in video number three.